And now, here is Ted DeCorsia in the Peace the Lane Mystery, That Hammer Guy. <laughs> You're not a poetic guy, at least you won't admit to it around the joints where you hang out. But come the spring and the hardcore inside you starts to crack and melt away. And you find yourself rhyming June and moon. And like they say, in the springtime a guy's fancy turns to thoughts of lighter things. Right now your fancy is turning to the lightest thing in your life. Your girl Friday's elbow is the juiciest looking game to you any day of the week. You've got an hour to slaughter before you date with her and you amble through Central Park. You spot the couples in clinches, and you're hoping that the warm evening breeze will melt that final wall of resistance, although it hides behind. You're walking along a gem lit path, creating exciting fantasies in your mind when you hear the voice. I beg your pardon. The dame is sitting on a bench alone, almost hidden in the shadow. Her voice has a pleasant tickling effect on your ears. Naturally, you're curious about the rest of it. You got time, so you walk over to her. My light is in a stubborn mood. Could you help me? You strike a match, and the light wipes away the shadows. You like what you see. You like it so much, you gawk like a kid who sees a sideshow dance act for the first time. You'd uh, better be careful. Huh? The match. You burn your fingers. The match? Oh, the match. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Thank you. Anything? My friend. Very. You, uh, waiting for somebody? Okay, it's none of my business. No, I'm not waiting for anyone. Why? Some kind of a funny place for a dame like you to be alone. I guess that's none of my business either. I'm not a dame. Well, just an expression I use loosely. Well, maybe you'd better tighten up your vocabulary. I'll uh, take that under advisement. I'm sorry, I had no right to be so nasty. Everybody should be that nasty with me. I came to the park because I like it here. Protective coloration, I, I beg your pardon? The black dress you're wearing and uh, sitting here in the shadows. Protective coloration. I learned about it in biology once. Animals use it to hide from other animals to prey. I have nothing to hide. This, I can see. Thanks again for the light. Glad to miss that. Now, so long. Oh, wait. Yeah? You, uh, you don't have to go if you don't want to. Well, I wasn't really. You're pretty sure of yourself, aren't you? Well, I've been known to make mistakes. Well, this might be a big one. I'll take my chances. A gambler? When the yards are right. I like you. You're direct. My name is Marsha Bowman. I like you. But you're not direct. I don't know what you mean. I mean, you're lying. What? About your name. Just what are you talking about? Your last name. It's not Bowen. No? Then what is it? You tell me. Just what sort of a game is this? Well, suppose you tell me that, too. No, it's me. Look, I'm I... no cop. I'm not going to blow the whistle on you. You think that... When I lit your cigarette, I saw the monogram on your bag. The initials were M and J, and Bowman doesn't begin with J, even on a loose vocabulary, does it? I'm sorry I was nice to you. No, you're not. You want me here with you. That's the idea, isn't it? Where did you get that silly idea? You want me here because you're in some kind of a jam. Oh, ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. You know I do. Why are you sitting here in the dark? Why'd you give me that phony name? That doesn't give a thing. Well, maybe this will. Bag, you stand and go. You give that back to me. I'll scream. Go ahead. Yell your head off. You. Ah, here's what I was talking about. This gun. A forty-five is kind of big to carry around in such a small purse, or is that the latest Parisian style? You give me that gun. Maybe, after we talk. You give it to me or I'll get the police. You do, and you'll have to show them a license. The cops are real fussy about things like that. Now, um, what about that talk? It wouldn't interest you. Try me and see. All right, all right, but do you mind if I light another cigarette first? up another match for her. You see her hand shake like a model T going over a rough road, and the muscles in her face draw tight. You flick out the match and wait for her to begin. But you don't even hear her get to the first word. <laughs> Something blunt and heavy cracks into the back of your skull. The red flash of pain rips through you, and then you dissolve into black nothing. When you come to, you feel in your pocket for a match, and the first thing your hand touches is a gun, and the steel of it is as warm as light. After you light up the match, you see it's the same gun, the dame's forty-five, and two shells are missing from the clip. Then on the grass behind the bench, you see the dame herself with two circles of blood just spoiling the front of her dress. She's dead, all right. And in your hand is the gun that killed her. You start looking through her handbag when you hear footfalls echoing down the walk. You make him out as he passes under a lamp. It's a cop and he's in a hurry. The way things stack, you figure you've got as much chance if you stick around as a bow-legged dame in a beauty contest. You get out of there and more of a hurry.
Then you phone Velda from the base station. Don't tell me who this is. Let me guess. Look, Velda, there's a legit reason for my being late. But of course, something in the way of business came up. Yeah, the worst kind. For you. Will you give me a chance to explain? Why bother? Will you listen? I was walking across the park and I met this dame. Just two ships that passed in the night. Oh, thanks. I just as soon spare myself the details if you don't mind. It's nothing like you think. It was murder. You're telling me. Look, the dame is dead, shot to death, and it looks like I did it. Mike, you're not kidding. I'm not kidding. Now, look, there's something you got to do for me. All right, Mike, anything. Anything. You give Zelda a fast rundown on what happened. Then you tell her to get in touch with your friend Captain Pat Chambers a homicide, but not to let on to it. I'll call Pat right away. You start to feel better after you hang up. You know Zelda can handle Pat okay. You're in a tough spot, but you got a dame on your side who can use her head for something else than the parking lot for hats. By the time you get to Velda's place, she's already talked to Pat. For a moment, you forget all about the jam. All you can think about is this appetizing dame, and you can't resist telling her. Don't you know there's a time and place for everything? We've got the place, and there's always time. Oh, what am I going to do with you anyway? Anything you want, and you'll know it. Well, right now, I want you out of this mess. Mike, you never should have run away. Well, I told you, Zelda, the odds were stacked against me. I was a sitting pigeon. You could have explained anything to Pat. He's your friend. He's also a cop. And the way things were, he'd have been as official with me as that badge he wears. Uh, what else did Pat tell you? Just what I told you. Nothing on our identification? They're making a fingerprint check. You sure a first name is Marcia? No, but it could be. And according to the monogram on that handbag, her last name began with a J. You no idea why she was killed. I told you, I just met her. Well, all right. You don't have to holler at me. Would you act like you still don't believe me? I want to, Mike. You can. It isn't going to be easy. Believing me? Finding the killer. There's nothing to go on. Just one thing. What? I'm just watching her pocketbook when I yanked out the gun. It was the only other thing in there. Hmm. Women don't usually carry a watch like that. Yeah, but men do. And there's this inscription on the inside. To G.N. with a letter from M.J., 1953. M.J., the girl's initials. Yeah. It's yeah, something, Mike. Right? Mm, could be more. I can trace it to the store where it was bought. Oh, wait. What? Something I forgot. Pat did say they had some chance of cracking the case. It's lucky you left that gun at the scene of the crime. The serial number? Mm-mm, no, the serial number was filed off. Then? They did find fingerprints on the gun. That should help. Oh, yeah, great help. It'll help lead Pat right straight to me. A hundred to one, those prints on the gun are mine. In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. So you're off and running in another rat race, only this time it's yourself you're trying to keep out of the trap. And so far, the only thing that's going to keep it from closing on you is that man's watch you got out of the dead dame's handbag. You and Velda do a tracking job. Two days later, you trace the watch to a jewelry store in Madison Avenue. And from there, the trail leads to the Elms, a roadhouse up in Westchester where the right connections will get you into the back room where the suckers first with Lady Luck on the green felt card and dice table. It's 9 in the p.m. when you amble into the joint, and you're greeted by a bamboo blonde who looks like she just stepped down from the G.I. spin-up collection. Hello. The way she says that is intended to make you feel like you're the last guy on earth. Oh, you're alone. Hello. I'm Dorothy Peters. Maybe I can help? I wouldn't be surprised, Dorothy. Well, I'm here to help. Do what I can to light my pinks in the evening. And their uh, pocketbooks, too? Now, that is a crude enough. Oh, I'm a crude guy. I 
Yes, I like a man who doesn't put his punches. Actually, I like a dame who can take it. Oh, then we'll get along fine. Only time will tell. I have all evening. I wish I did. You know what hates me? Uh, maybe we'll talk about the pros and cons of that later. Well, there's a cozy table over there in the corner. Why not talk about it now? Because right now, there's some talking I want to do with Ted Beckley, the character who runs this joint. Oh, he's expecting you? Mm-hmm. But Ted's busy, I know. Uh, suppose you tell him I've got to see him anyway. Well, you make it sound really important. A murder is always kind of important, especially to the one who gets killed. What's this all about? Well, right now, Darby, that's between Beckley and me. And uh, that door over there marked a private up to Beckley's office. Yeah, you, you come on. I'll take you to the table. Yeah, You wait here, please. Oh. Hey, there's someone outside. Oh, well, who is it, Darby? I don't know. The name is Hammer Beckley, my camera. Hey, who asked you in here? Can't you read? A sign that door says private, and that means strictly. Uh, that's what I'm hearing about, Beckley. Something strictly private. He says it's something about murder to you. You a cop? Uh-huh. I just keep this hat on because I didn't brush my hair this morning. Come on, what are you? A crude guy by nature, a private investigator by what they call profession. What's this murder stuff about? And that's what I want to find out. You don't talk sense. I will. Get back out front, Darcy. But I... Do what I tell you. Well, all right, sir. Okay, Hammer, let's have it. There was a killing a couple of nights ago in Central Park, a dame. So far, she hasn't been identified. I traced the man's watch she'd bought a year ago to a jewelry store. According to the store's record, that watch was nailed here to a George Norton. Know anything about Norton? George used to be my partner. The dame who bought the watch gave me the name of Marsha Jordan. Know anything about her? Uh, sure, Marsha used to work here. She was George's girlfriend before he took up with Dorothy. The dame who brought me in here. That's right. You see Marsha Jordan lately? No, not for six months. Not since that night it happened. Since what happened? Since that night, George and Marsha went for that car ride. Since that night, the police killed a cop found George Norton in that car with two slugs in his head. After you leave Beckley's joint, you drive up to Peekskill and check out his story with a local gendarme. Beckley fed it to you straight, all right, right down the line. Then you stop at a gin mill across the street and phone Veldy in town. But now that Marcia herself is dead, it, it could mean the police are wrong about her. You know it could mean that. It could mean that she kept herself under wraps for six months to save her own skin. What now, Mike? What now? You feel as useless as a deep freeze in an igloo. You tell Zelda you'll see her at the office in the morning. All right, Mike, but take it easy, you promise? Zelda knows you. She knows the frustration leads you to the bottle. You hang up, not making any empty promises. Then you go over to the bar and order a double bourbon. You mind if I join you? You tell the little guy with a mouthful of gleaming white choppers that you do mind. To be alone, that is bad enough. To be alone, and I'm happy that it's terrible. Look, if I want my fortune told, I'll go to a gypsy zero. I only try to be friendly. I got enough friends. And perhaps enemies, too, huh? Do you like that music? Yeah, rumba. I put the money in a machine to play that. Yeah, rumba. My favorite. I always play that one. For five cents, you can recapture a memory. The song. One song can mean so much in your life. Uh, look, whatever your name oh, is. Carlos I... Gomez. And it's a pleasure to know you. That song, a sad memory. Even the moment I recapture is not really mine. She was so beautiful, like a star. But she could never be mine. I danced with her only once to that song. I think inside she laughed at me. I was so nervous and so clumsy. But I didn't care if she left. I would have done anything for her. Anything she asked, no matter what she thought of me. Beautiful. Like a star. Can you understand what I mean? Yeah, maybe I can, but what's the difference? Oh, it is especially important that you understand. Why me? Because perhaps in a way you can do something for her, which I can. Why should I do anything for her, whoever she is? Because you will be doing it for yourself at the same time. She was Marsha Jordan. Why? I follow you here. I overhear what you said at Beckley's place. I'm a waiter there. Waiter, but I'm a man too. None of them, they don't know what a man I am. They don't know anything about me. Soon I will laugh at them. Out loud, I will ask the Jordan dance. Every time I play that music, I close my eyes. I see myself dancing with her. That one dance. I see myself not clumsy and nervous the way I was, but elegant and graceful. You said I could do something for myself. And for her. You mean about getting a killer? Yes. Yeah. Well, what is it? Tomorrow night, I will have what you want. I am sure. Well, what's the matter with tonight? No, no. You will have to wait till tomorrow. There will be no mistake then. You can meet me. You name the place and when, Gomez. The side street around the corner. Ten o'clock, you step out of your car, I will come to you. Ten o'clock. All right, I'll be there. Oh, she was like a star. So beautiful, but this time. You 
go back to town, and all the next day you're haunted by Carlos Gomez's pathetic dream of love, his tragic devotion to a dame as far out of his reach as a star. You're at your place, getting set to drive up to Peekskill for your meeting with Gomez. Hello? Is this my camera? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad I got to you before you left. Who is this? Uh, that's not important. I had to talk to you before you went up to meet Carlos Gomez. Well, how did you know about Don't that? Don't ask any questions. Just listen to what I got to say to you. I just found out what Gomez is going to put on you. He isn't going to give you what you're looking for. Who told you I had an appointment with Gomez? Please, will you just listen? You want to stay alive, don't you? Yeah, I'm sure you said I have it now. Well, you won't if you meet Gomez. Believe me, the minute you step out of your car to meet Gomez, you'll get the same as the others got. Two bullets through you. You got a good idea who made that call, but you're not checking back on it just yet. Now you're not sure what to expect, so you make ready for any kind of a twist. That warning you figure could have been a gimmick to sidetrack you, and then again it could have been legitimate. So you get hold of Delta, and you two work out an emergency arrangement. You drive up to Peekskill to meet Carlos Gomez the way you set it up. Besides, the street is as dark and deserted as a losing candidate's headquarters an hour after the election results are in. You're parked right in the middle of the block. You figure the car up ahead is Gomez. You wait a second and then open the door. It won't be long now till you find out just what Gomez's intentions are. You lift the dressmaker's dummy from the seat beside you and push it on the sidewalk. Gomez makes his intentions known just one second later. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the Mickey Spillane mystery, That Hammer Guy. Now, back to the Mickey's Belay mystery, That Hammer Guy. Right after the shot flipped the air, Gomez's car starts up and fades into the night. You turn your coupe around and start back to town. All the way back, you keep thinking of those two neat round holes the slugs made in the dummy's head. You feel a lot better that they're not in your head. You're in your place for only a couple of minutes when the call from Zelda comes through. I did as you told me, Mike. And? I've been on Gomez's trail from the time his car pulled out of that side street. Believe me, I wanted to go back to you after I heard those shots. Are you all right? Yeah, but you should see that dummy. Uh, where are you, Helen? I'm calling from a bar up in White Plains, a place called the Onyx. It's on Central Avenue. Gomez goes straight there? Mm-hmm. He's sitting in a booth in the rear. Keeps looking around as if he were expecting someone. Okay, honey. I'm on my way up. <laughs> You get in your coupe and go up the West Side Drive, cut into Central Avenue and stay on it until you get to the Onyx and White Plains. Well, there is to wait for you at the phone in the front part of the joint, but she isn't there. You're starting to get some black, unhappy thoughts about her when you spot her waving to you from a booth in the rear. Oh, Mike, am I glad you are here? I thought you'd never get here. What's wrong? What? I, I didn't know what to do, Mike. It's an awful spot. Why? What are you talking about? What happened to Gomez? Where is he? Well, that's what I'm talking about, Gomez. Well, come on, come on. Where is he? That's where I found him after I phoned you. I didn't know how it happened. Well, but will you make sense? What happened to Carlos Gomez? Where is he? Just where I found him, here in the booth, under the table. What? Look for yourself, Mike. He's dead. <laughs> You look for yourself. Gomez is dead, all right. He's rolled up and up all under the table, and the brown handle of a knife is sticking out between his shoulder blades. Mike, what are we going to do? There's only one thing for you and Velda to do. Get out of there and pass. You can feel it trembling as you take her arm on the way out. Oh, Mike, I never was so glad to see anybody in my life. You tell her you're going to make her prove that later on when there's time. I'm going with you. I've gone this far. You tell her she's gone far enough. From here on, you're playing at the keep. After you put Velda in her car and send her off, you drive over to Beckley's Roadhouse. Ted Beckley isn't any healthier this time. Dorothy Peters is conspicuously absent from the joint. You find out where she lives and go over to her place. Yes? Oh, you. The way she says that is intended to make you feel like you're the last guy on earth. It's the last guy she wants to see. What do you want? First, I want to thank you for lightening my evening. I know what you're talking about. I'm talking about that phone call you made to me before I left for my appointment with Gomez. Phone call? Gomez? You're not making sense. According to the switchboard record downstairs, I'm making a lot of sense. You made a call to my number. So the least I can do is to thank you for my life. I'm curious. Uh, why did you bother? Yeah, Dorothy, why did you bother? <laughs> Oh, I did Hammer. This time I'm inviting you. I don't see how I can refuse your invitation, Beckley. Well, I don't see how either. Well, it's been great on this 45. 
Inside, both of you. So you weren't feeling well tonight, huh, Darcy? Sick. So you couldn't come to work. Ted, You're going to be even sicker. I followed you here, Hammer. Failing me has turned out to be a sort of a national sport. I followed you because you gave me sort of a shock when you showed up at my place alive. You know what I mean? I can guess. Dorothy, he doesn't have to guess. She knows. Don't you, Dorothy? Well, no, Dorothy I... Dorothy does, Hammer. She knows I had you tapped for the same place I sent George Norton. I had it set up nice and neat. Carlos Gomez was going to put on another shooting session for me, just like he did on Norton. But somebody tripped up me and Gomez. And it's a good thing Gomez isn't alive to hear about it. He'd be awfully disappointed. Gomez is... Dave? Didn't break my heart. I figured I didn't need him anymore. I had somebody pay him off at the Onyx Bar over in White Plains. Now to you, Dorothy. Somebody tipped Hammer off. That somebody was you. Well, no, Ted, I wouldn't do a thing like that. Besides, how would I know? You didn't tell me. Nobody knew about the deal I had with Gomez except you. But, but, but you didn't tell me, Ted. That's right, I didn't. Well, then how could I know? I tried to figure out how Hammer got wise, and then I remembered. I remembered you were standing outside my office last night when Gomez walked out. You had your ear to the door. You heard what we said. All right. Ted, I heard. Well, I can say thanks again anyway, Dorothy. Why did you do it? Why? Marcia Jordan. What? You wasn't a bad kid. You promised me, Ted, you wouldn't keep after her. You promised me as long as you kept the mouth closed about George Norton, you'd let her alone. What was she to you? Nothing. Just a nice kid. Too nice to get what she ended up with. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I set up a nice spot for us. I get Norton out of the way so the club is mine. Ours. And then you go full of rotten, lousy trick like that. I couldn't help it, Ted. You can't go on killing. I had to stop you somewhere. Just had to stop you. No wonder you didn't call the cops. I just wanted to stop you, that's all. And she did, Beckley. Not yet, Hammer. There's still you. And her. You won't get away so easy this time. I'll take my chances. Now get over there with her. Go on, get over there. You're over next to the dame. You can see she doesn't feel any way about it. But with you, it's different. Like I said, I'll take my chances. And you'll take yours. You don't know just how, but you do know you don't have much of a choice. But when the dog buzzer starts to cough, you get an unexpected choice. Quickly takes his eyes off you for an instant, and in that instant, you take off with a flying leap head first. You hit him with all you've got, and the wind hisses out at him like gas is going from a jet. He goes down and starts to roll on the floor like a lopsided apple. The guy's still in his hand, and he can still make a lot of trouble for you. So you bend over him, and with a back of your hand, back him right behind the ear. From then on, he's a sleeping rabbit. The buzzer is still sounding off. You go to the door and open it. And you find out the twists aren't finished for this evening yet. Well, it took you long enough to answer. Zelda glares at you like the schoolgirl that finds her boyfriend carving another kid's initials on a tree. I followed you because I thought you might need me. And what happens? I find you in another woman's apartment. You tell her you've never been so glad to see anybody in your life. You're going to have a job proving that. Everything is proven for you when you bring her in and show her back. On the way back to town, she tells you how sorry she is. I am, right. I'm so sorry for you, sir. But the way things stack up, you're not a bit sorry. Because that final wall of resistance, all that keeps between her and you, starts to crumble into the beautiful dust. 